Planning Commission podcast is a spirited discussion with myself and a couple of my longtime colleagues in the profession. Our discussions are based solely on our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions or views of our employer, the American Planning Association, or even our alma maters. So grab a seat in the back of City Hall, dig out an old copy of Robert's Rules, and for goodness sakes, read your packet. The Planning Commission is now in session. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Planning Commission podcast. What's going on, fellow commissioners? How are we doing on this Friday? I'm glad Friday's here. Yes, thank you. It's been a heavy travel <laughs> week. Friday. Heavy travel week, heavy snow. It's very exciting. Uh, up here. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, well, yeah, you're close to Santa Claus up there. It should be nice and snowy this time of year, right? I would hope so. We're just bringing in all those letters from... You know, hopefully the good boys and girls, but <laughs> I know you all's letters are just going to be full of things like, can I please have another bike lane? Yeah, no doubt about it. Or as consultants, <laughs> well, as consultants sending out our gift baskets of buckets of coal <laughs> and other things at this time of year. Right. Oh, so yeah. No, you. <laughs> it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder. We got to get that done, Don. So today's episode, parking and Costco samples, two free things Americans line up for. <laughs> Commissioners, I got to ask you, your pet peeves about parking, we all have them. One or another, one thing or another, I know that everybody has some sort of a bane when it comes to parking, right? I know what some of mine might be, but I'm going to ask you first, what might your pet peeves about parking be in this wonderful country of ours? Thoughts? Commissioner not Smith? It. Not, oh, not it. it. Okay. <laughs> um. Wow, you know, I think mine has evolved over the years and and in the profession and certainly being somebody that, you know, walks, bikes and takes transit and like does it for transportation, not recreation, you inevitably have to walk across this massive sea of parking Mm -hmm. to get from a sidewalk or a bus stop or what have you. And it just feels like it's this constant threat. And I also think like psychologically, I don't know that I feel that way if I'm driving and pull into a parking lot and am the same pedestrian. Is it just this psychological specter that you have when you've been in a non-car mode for a time and now all of a sudden you're exposed to this? And then recently just seeing what, and, and we'll have Joe Minicozzi on in an upcoming episode of just how parking drains fiscal budgets, is heavily subsidized, compromises uh, affordable housing and all of that. And I know we'll get into those things with today's uh, Yoda of parking. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, no doubt. Jess, what do you got? I know you got some. Well, I'm reminded of a time when Don and I were working on a project and um, a lot of a uh, lot of small businesses in the community we were working in. Do you remember this, Don? And we were looking at, and you pulled information about how the the big box store there, their parking lot took up X Y Z's, you know, acres. And as a, at the time, I was a a public, I was at a um, you know at a county, and you know, looking at tax value of land. Um, it was like those that big box store paid less per acre in taxes than like a small community store that had like a little tiny footprint that was local, right? And and um, you know where we talk about local investing in your local community and these types of things. Um, why why do we allow this to happen as as planners and community developers? How do why do we allow things mm. that are essentially just little spots to house a thing that's not a person, it's a vehicle, right? Um, that it's carrying people, sure, and all that, but we make it very, very cheap and easy, um, not only for the people there, but also for that business owner and everything. But then the 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 disproportionate like tax burden on a small business that that doesn't need as many spaces because they're, you know, their square footage is bigger. So anyway, I may be messing this up, Don, but I, do you remember that? And I was Oh yeah, like, no, it's, oh. uh, it's, it's a common thing. And even yeah. this earlier this week, I was in a very small town, 900 people in Eastern Idaho. I was staying in that town and not a lot going on there. And there's two new buildings. Well, one's a renovated hotel, which is fantastic. The other one is like a new kind of higher end home goods store. 
And I swear in this small town downtown, the parking lot they were required to build to the side took up more than the building footprint <laughs> itself. And it was all brand new and pristine. There's zero utilization of on street parking here. And you're sitting here going, one, why are you taking up all that unnecessary land? Why are you not counting on street parking in the consideration of this? And I'm guessing for that town of 900, it's just a zoning code that was cut and pasted from 20 other places that they implemented. And okay, it's never been thought about. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, Commissioner Danley, your turn. Oh, I got lots of parking pe pet peeves, man. <laughs> I mean, how could I feel you like not, this is right? what keeps you up at night. This is your... He sees it every week. That. He Hold sees that. it every week as a real planning commission. Yeah. Oh, like a real that's true. I forgot. He on, actually on knows Monday, what he's doing. <laughs> on Monday, we got a hearing, and I'm positive I'll hear that word parking about 300 times. I've already read it in our thousand page packet, probably, I don't know, however many hundred times, but I'm gonna go in a whole different way, right? I personally, it's man, what drives me crazy about parking, it, one of the things anyway is our just general culture that we have this impression that there's not enough of it. And I hear that all the time, right? Like, oh my gosh, there's not, what, what, a, this is, you remember the, the, the Saturday Night Live, what was his name? Garrett, uh, what's his name? He was the translator, <laughs> the skit where he would yell and he would translate. Well, I forgot what that skit was about, but my point is, is that when I'll translate on behalf of America, because what they really mean is there isn't a parking stall 15 feet from the front door. That's what they actually mean, yeah. right? And I'll never, ever forget the days of being a personal trainer and watching my clients who wanted to lose weight and get in better physical shape, right? In the parking lot, doing loops, doing laps until they can get right up front. And I, they would come in and I'm just going, what are you doing? What are you doing? Right? Like just park for crying out loud. Burn one extra calorie. It's just because it's not in front of the dang door doesn't mean it ceased to, ceases to exist, right? It, it actually is out there. And I see it all the time, man. And I hear it all the time. And I, I don't understand why people can't see all those empty stalls and all that asphalt just sitting there. So that's my pet peeve. I mean, I don't know. Am I way off base there? No, oh, I also no, don't not understand. at all. I mean, it's I, I'm the weirdo that parks at the far end of the lot just to get in <laughs> extra steps. Yeah, and well, my fiance, <laughs> my fiance, will kind of be pointing me toward a closer spot and a closer spot. I'm like, no, it's easy in, easy out. I no, I'm well, good with that. But you got a 1974 Gremlin that you're yeah. trying to protect, well, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a classic ride. So I get it. I get it. I get it. Anyway, all right, whiskey pairing. Commissioner Ooh. Kostelik, I was, what I was, is our whiskey du jour for uh, this episode? I was happy when I came around this one because it was totally unexpected. Does happy mean drunk? Uh, no, that, oh, no. Okay. I just looked at it and I went, this is going to fit our guest today, Don Shoup, perfectly. I have Trader Joe's <gasps> Trader Kentucky... Joe's. Bourbons, Kentucky bourbon straight whiskey. It doesn't That's good. Kentucky we can see it. straight bourbon whiskey. That's it. Hold that. it. Hold it right there. I want to see that label. Can you tilt it this way? A little to the left. If you could just cover up the mustache entirely. I think that'd be perfect. No. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. Kentucky bourbon. Here we go. Right. Kentucky we Trader go. Joe's. And reason why, I mean, yeah. Trader Joe's for kind of our quintessential big box chain kind of has the parking thing figured out. They've got it down to a science. They kind of know their capacity. They know their turnover. They know all those kind of things. The other side of this, Kentucky bourbon straight whiskey, not Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. And I know Chris and I have a friend that swears by only drinking Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. So I don't know where this one fits in that. But there you go. If you're in a state that Trader Joe's can sell hard liquor, you're likely to find it about fifteen dollars a bottle. I came across this at the one in West, bucks a West Seattle. Yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. It's the same. That. It's the same headache I think people feel when they <laughs> gripe about parking at <laughs> After the Trader fact. Joe's sometimes. <laughs> oh yes, oh, we all boy. know. In ours in downtown, holy cow! Right, everyone complains about it all the time. Like, really? Come on, again. Look, just... you have a Trader Joe's. There's not a Trader Joe's in my whole state. Okay, it's mm. a sad situation. This is true. This is true, but. Anyway, all right. Well, with that, it's time for us to bring on our guest. And there is nobody in the country. Let me say that again for anybody listening or watching. There is nobody in this country who knows more and has studied 
this concept and this topic of parking and planning than our guest today. Our guest is incredibly renowned for his knowledge and depth and prolific writing on the subject of parking, Mr. Donald Shoup. Mr. Donald Shoup, welcome to the Planning Commission podcast. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me. I was afraid you'd never ask. <laughs> well, we know that you are a parking rock star and rock stars, you know, have a busy schedule. So we appreciate you making the time to be on with us today. And uh, thank you again for, for joining us. Well, um, I, I, I was flattered to be called a parking rock star, but that's not the same thing as a real rock star. Um, oh, although I sometimes call myself Shoop Dog. Uh, I love that. Yes. I think I called you that before we, when we were planning this, I was like, are yeah. we having the Shoop Dog? Can we call him that? I feel well, good that, about it. <laughs> well, Sno Snoop and I were both born in Long Beach, so that has to count for something. Basically yeah, the same. <laughs> you guys go way back. I will say that there were a couple of things that I, I was particularly drawn to, in addition to, of course, your knowledge, but that was one of them. Your website, you know, and the, the moniker of Shoop Dog is just brilliant. But the other one is <laughs> one of your more recent writings. I need you to understand that we are a commission of the absurd. We try to find and acknowledge and hopefully wipe out the absurd in planning. And so, so basically one of the things that you wrote about um, was this absurd and, and your example of citing a particular code was how many parking stalls were required for a massage parlor? <laughs> and I just thought that it doesn't get any more absurd than that, because how does some planner sit around and go, hmm, how many spots do we need for that particular land use? So, yes, <laughs> all over it. How did that? What a brilliant writing, by the way. Well, I think when you look at the, the uh, zoning codes, you see that there are adult massage parlors or... And when you look at the adult uses, there are adult bookstores and uh, adult uh, theaters and, and uh, adult sex toy shops. And you wonder how do planners know there are so many different <laughs> requirements among these uses? So uh, I know the planning isn't always as, as glamorous a profession as you thought it would be, but it does have its some high spots. We always categorize those under quick lubes. That's when we look those up in the trip and parking generation manuals. I don't know. Is that a high turnover, low turnover? I don't, I don't know. Depends <laughs> on what you're looking for. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Mr. Shoup, if you wouldn't mind, just give our audience a little bit of, a, of an overview of who you are, if they are unfamiliar with you. I know you have an extensive background and resume, but if you could hit some of the highlights for us, we'd appreciate it. And then we'd love to ask some questions. Well, uh, I suppose the first thing to say is I'm old. Uh, the uh, first uh, publication I had on Parker that included Parker was in 1970. Wow. Uh, so I've been thinking <laughs> about it for a long time. Um, and where other people thought there was really nothing to see, I thought there was a lot to see. And I think uh, more people are coming around. That's why I I guess I got invited onto your podcast, uh, is that some people have, have become interested in this. And I was listening to your conversation before I was put on the air. And I thought Jessica was saying, how do planners allow this mess of all these huge parking lots and uh, taking up so much valuable land in the, the middle of towns? Well, it isn't that planners uh, allow it, the planners require it. You know, I think really most of the, the blame goes to planning commissioners. They're the ones who were responsible for telling <laughs> what the planning department should do. And they somehow think that planners do know how many parking spaces a massage parlor needs. Um, and if the planning commission, you, you know, they were put under pressure from angry neighbors saying, well, there's this massage parlor within my neighborhood. and uh, how did you let this happen? Uh, there's so many cars parked on the street. And so they, the, the planning commission said, well, tell us the parking requirement for a massage parlor. And a planner has no way of knowing that any more than any of you do. Uh, they, they've learned nothing about parking and their planning education. Um, 
they uh, learn it only as a, as a political skill on the job. Because if the planning commission said, well, what is the parking requirement we should set for a, a uh, massage parlor? Uh, the, the young planner can't say, I don't know, or mm -hmm. I, I don't think we should have parking requirements because he'd be fired. They would be fired if they were said, I don't think we should have parking requirements because the planning commission isn't going to have a young planner come along and say, what you've asked me to do is a bunch of nonsense. Um, <laughs> it's like, I mean, Parking requirements are no more scientific than astrology. Uh, maybe <laughs> astrology is more scientific than this than massage astrology. parlor is a Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, or a cancer. <laughs> well, Don, what, what's so Ooh. funny about you just said, you know, planners have had no training in this, they haven't had any education in parking. I am notoriously the person on this podcast that doesn't have a planning degree. I have two engineering degrees. And I did have a class um, about parking. And um, it wasn't all about parking. It was called transportation funding and policy. And it was in the civil engineering department. And I had to read your book. <laughs> that was the that was one of the uh, books we had to read. And so I came in going, well, this seems dumb. Why doesn't everybody read this book and, and understand the concept that this that we could do this a little bit better and a little bit more um, well, put together. Well the, well, the reason they don't read it is because it's 800 pages long. So oh, no, this time. was an excerpt. <laughs> exer he knew what pl engineering students. Dr. Uh, Hummer was like, you read this part and hear the clip notes. And we it takes a it. really long <laughs> massage to get through that many uh, pages. So. Wow. Well, the best, so. <laughs> when an engineer talks about learning how to fund parking, they be how to fund it uh, by anything other than asking the user to pay for it. That's what funding means, is finding somebody <laughs> else to pay for it. And we've done that. Planning has done that. The, yeah. the miraculous thing, but it, it's too cheap to meter. And we've got so much of it. And it's because we require it. And for, for any parking requirement that is more than three spaces per thousand square feet of floor area, that means the parking lot is bigger than the building. It's very <laughs> common, say for the, 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 the typical parking requirement for a fast food restaurant is 10 parking spaces per thousand square feet, which means that the, uh, the, the parking lot is more than three times the size of, of the McDonald's. Uh, so I think that uh, we've got so much parking because planners require it. And I think, <laughs> They always tell you to tell a story to illustrate what you're talking about. <laughs> and I think the, 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 the story I'll tell at the beginning is suppose uh, around 1900, uh, Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller had asked you what planning policies uh, should we have to, in, to, to increase the demand for cars and fuel? What would you recommend? Well, consider these three policies, you could say that it, that'll work, is that uh, uh, separate land uses. Uh, uh, so there's housing here, and jobs there, and um, uh, education someplace else, and commerce else, another place. So when you go from one thing to another, you have to move from one zone to another. That will increase travel. Um, and it will increase the demand for cars and fuel. And then uh, limit the density at every, at every site, say that there could be no more than uh, uh, a floor area of one-to-one. -one. You can't have more building area than, uh, floor, than, than, than the lot area, or it could be three-to-one. You could have three times as much floor area as you have land area. And for, for apartment buildings, it might be, uh, you know, here in LA, it would be if, for what they call middle, missing middle of housing, about, about 50 parking spaces uh, per acre. <clears throat> um, so what we have is the zoning has maximum housing limits, that the zoning is always putting a maximum on what you could do. Uh, and yeah. this, the, the buildings have to be four feet from the side lot, 
<laughs> so that will that if you if you lower the density everywhere, you set maximum densities, uh, that'll increase the demand for 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 driving because the place will be all spread out. And then then here's the third policy: is have minimum parking requirements everywhere, <laughs> so that wherever you go, uh, you'll find ample off-street parking waiting for you required by the city. And these are the three things that cities have done. That is our uh, planning policy, that we have, we have parking minimums and housing maximums. Is it any surprise that we have too many cars and not enough housing? So why should people care about because, all this parking? Because everybody, everybody wants to park free including okay. you and me. Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, I love Target. <laughs> uh, well, and, and, and Trader Joe's is always complained about because it, uh, it's difficult to park at Trader Joe's. And that's one part of it is that Trader Joe's has the highest sales per square foot of floor area of any retail store. Uh, and that means a lot of people and they don't uh, uh, unfortunately, Trader Joe's is owned by a German company that does not give free parking in Germany. <laughs> and they provide only I as know. much as absolutely required. They never provide more than is required. So people say it's so hard to, 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 to park at Trader Joe's, which means, of course, that the parking demand is not related to floor area, it's related to the, 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 the commerce in the building. No, you, can't. You, you make a great point there because I, when we have these discussions and where Chris and I are in Boise, Idaho now, we're talking about a zoning code rewrite and, and definitely getting at the parking maximum piece of that. But it's, it's something we hear a lot of, well, let the free market take care of that. Let that do its thing. Where is the validity or the fallacy in that statement? Well, free park, the... the... Free parking is usually not the free market, it's free loading. And, <laughs> and, and it's the, and I think, it, whether it's in Idaho or in California, that uh, uh, a, a city where everybody happily pays for everybody else's free parking is a ship of fools. It's just a fool's paradise to think that if we all pay for each other's parking through requirement, through planning, that, that, that nothing can be built that doesn't have enough parking, the cost of parking gets hidden in the cost of everything else. It means higher prices for housing, for food, uh, for anything you do, a little bit of the funds get siphoned off to pay for the required parking. So we have miraculously learned how to park free. We built a, a, a national grid of roads for Driving is the way to get everywhere. And now the Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller don't have to urge minimum parking requirements. It's the customers do. You, you would, any planning commissioner knows that the residents say there's not enough parking. And yeah. how could you let this happen? That How did you let this building be built that doesn't have enough parking? So I have a solution, if you will give me time to talk about that, but let's talk about more of your well, questions. It almost seems to me like we talk about the parking is subsidized. And then going back to your Trader Joe's example and, and why I chose that whiskey, they kind of have it down to a science. They know their market. They know their maximization of square footage. And to me, we have upset the free market and Trader Joe's being an example of the free market that kind of knows it knows it down to a science, but we as cities will step in here and go, no, these are the parking requirements we want you to have. And we're therefore usurping it versus requiring developers to do their due diligence, to do their own studies and truly understand it that I'm sure for every chain store, you know, they know it. So to me, it's just kind of like just another way we subsidize uh, that whole facet of urban design. Well, when you say B, you mean planning. <laughs> that planning for, for parking is, shows the perils of central planning. I mean, we've had central yeah. planning fail in many other countries. But if I think that if the, in the United States, um, the, the, the cities or 
the federal government manage anything in your life the way we manage parking, telling you exactly how many square feet you have to have in your apartment and exactly how many horsepower you have to have in your car <laughs> and how short your skirt should be or how long your pants should be. If the, if the federal government tried to do anything like that, we'd all join the Tea Party. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that, that we've taken it somehow there's this parking exceptionalism is different from everything else. You never try to manage anything else the same way with, you know, size, with regulations, the, the time limits, and the no toe, no, no standing. That, 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 that Often there are five or six signs so it's on one pole saying oh, all the regulations, man. but no prices. <laughs> No price. Uh, well, well, yeah. it's just, so, so, so I can say it before we end this session. I do have a solution. The shoop dogma. And the shoop dogma. <laughs> shoop dogma. <laughs> that, that's right. It's got three points. And one is to charge the lowest prices for curb parking that will leave one or two open spaces on every block. So wherever you drive, you'll see one or two open curb spaces waiting for you. Um, and so the prices will have to vary by time of day and by by location. Uh, but if, if what they do in San Francisco and other cities now is that if all the spaces are occupied in the you know the past couple of months, uh, that at noon time that means we increase the price at noon time. Uh, and if there are a lot of empty spaces, we lower it. It's sort of like the Goldilocks principle of parking prices. Uh, that not too high, not too low, but just right. Just right means one or two open curb spaces. And second, to make that popular, uh, which sounds awful, to, it sounds like political suicide to start charging market prices for curb parking, um, is to spend the meter revenue uh, directly on the meter block to pay for added public services. Some cities give say Boulder, Colorado gives free transit passes to everybody who works downtown or lives downtown and pays for it with uh, parking meter revenue. Uh, some cities give free Wi-Fi to everybody. If you have parking meters, you get free Wi-Fi. Oh, but more typically, they sweep the sidewalks every night. They uh, pressure wash them once a month. Uh, they plant street trees, whatever the people want. What the neighbor would like would like to see more of. You say, well, uh, you could have this if you ask to have uh, market prices for curb parking, and if you don't, if you want to have free parking, <laughs> they won't pay for these things. So you have to figure out what people want, and then say, uh, ask them what what is your highest priority. As a, one of the best advice I had is if you're going to talk about parking reform, don't even mention parking. Just say, what do you want? Do you want a shuttle bus to downtown? Uh, do you want a child care center? I don't know. Something that's very local. And find out what they really want. They say, well, some cities finance this with uh, charging for curb parking. Uh, would you like to have that? And when it's put in those terms where they say that, uh, that if we have, if we, if we charge the right price for curb parking, we'll get all these benefits. And if we don't charge the right price for curb parking, we won't get any of these benefits. Say, and some cities have, find it difficult because they already spend the money, the rev, parking meter revenue, and put it into the general fund, which provides benefits, but nobody sees them. It's like sending the money to the UN. Uh, <laughs> but, if you, but if you say that it comes right back out of the other side of the meter, and power washes your sidewalks twice a month. Um, and uh, it's clean and safe, like a business improvement district. Then people will say, well, I want these high, the, the mark, it isn't necessarily high prices. It's just, it's the lowest price the city can charge and still have one or two open spaces. And then the third part of the shoot dogma is remove all street parking requirements. Because if you could see empty meter spaces okay. everywhere, What's the point of saying you have to have a parking off street parking lot three times the size of the restaurant? Yeah. Uh, so I think those three things and, and I are are the key. I hope. And I made these uh, propositions in the 2005 in the high cost of free parking, and I thought it was going to take the world by storm. 
but, but of course it didn't. And here I am now on a planning commission podcast. Uh, <laughs> what, what is that? 17 years later? Uh, but the world has changed. The, the many cities are removing their parking requirements. And some of them are doing what I recommended. And I, I recommend it for every planning commission and every city planner is to do what Nashville did and Mexico City did, which I claim was a good idea, is that uh, keep all of the uh, parking required numbers the same, you know, say it's three spaces per thousand square feet of massage parlor, but uh, <laughs> call the maximums rather than minimums. Yeah. That because if if the planners said that was enough and we're requiring enough, you just prohibit more than enough. Okay. I think it should be uh, clear that that we should be able to prohibit more than enough off street parking and then get rid of the minimum. <laughs> so I think if that's what the, Nashville did, that they all the numbers are the same. Now you think it happened in San Francisco and Washington D.C. and Boston. We said, well, big places with a lot of resources, and they uh, to find that now places like Nashville are doing the same thing. I mean, not that it's a bad city or a small city, even, but I think it shows it's a more progressive city than just yeah. about any other city. Except, except for in the the current brand of what falls as country music. In this case, <laughs> hey. people argue I, tremendously. I think yeah. your point there. I mean, Nashville to me is a, a a better example of a city that can do it that relates to the cities that are challenged by that. Um, type of policy and i would even say where we are in boise it's one of those things we hear a lot of well we can't really you know do anything with the downtown on street parking because we don't have a good transit system yet and i've asked researchers every time about is there anything to bolster that attitude and opinion and universally the answer is no well that's right we we don't have much transit ridership we've got a lot of transit service but the buses are largely empty the average occupancy of a bus in the United States is 25% of the number of seats. Yeah, We, we lack riders, not transit vehicles, <laughs> uh, but we're never going to get a lot of riders if we have ample free parking everywhere you go. Uh, so I think that it's, uh, you know, which comes first. Yeah. Uh, that we, we, we have to spend hundreds of, well, trillions of dollars on mass transit, and then we can remove the parking requirements. I think we can remove the parking requirements right now, and some cities are doing it. It's happening faster and faster that I think, you know, some things in life, you, as you get older, you realize some things take much longer to happen than you thought they would. But yeah. then they start happening much faster than you thought they could. And say, <laughs> last, last week, uh, uh, I think four cities announced they're removing all street parking runs. Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Nashville. There's small cities as well. Say Fayetteville, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. They uh, were, got, got good publicity for it, is that it was a planner who worked uh, in downtown you know, you at the planning desk, you have to uh, advise people what can they can do with their land. Can they say they want to open a restaurant? And if there's parking requirements, you have to say, do you have the required parking? It isn't just for new things. It's for reusing old buildings. Mm -hmm. You cannot reuse an old building if you don't have enough parking spaces required for the new massage parlor. So you just can't open it up. Uh, so, and he realized, well, it's the parking requirement that's prohibiting the reuse of older buildings in, in Fayetteville. And so they very easily got it through the planning commission and the city council, and they just removed them. And there were more restaurants opening up in old buildings. It's a terrific success. So I feel as though the national movement upon massage parlors is going to attribute their reduction of parking requirements <laughs> to this very episode oh yeah and so yeah. i'm not I agree. sure how i feel about that yeah but we did that listen you you said you wanted to leave a legacy chris <laughs> well, well, so, well, I, well i think that for planning commissions you're never going to get people to say they convince them that they should pay for parking but you can convince them they should charge for parking yeah. so they can, yeah. so they can get, get what they want. Uh, and I think, 
you'll never get people to say this is a good thing. In addition to Saturday Night Live, Sam, Seinfeld often had Parkin yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> whole sessions about yeah. Parkin. And, and one George was uh, going to J Jerry's apartment and Elaine was in his car and he was circling around hunting for a parking space. And Elaine said, well, why don't we just park in the building? And George exploded. I never pay for parking. Paying for parking <laughs> is like going to a prostitute. Why should I pay if when I apply myself, maybe I can get it for free? This well, has really become a red light episode. I would perfect. never have thought that. Wow. But we're always trying to get it for free. And we this have true. done it this with parking. True. That's Listen. the best analogy. I mean, it's, Listen, it sex works, work it works. is real work. Sex work is real work. You've got well, to remember it. this. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think, well, there are a lot of, 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 of I think, risque uh, aspects of, of parking. I think that, that parking is like sex, that if, if you have to pay for it, it's just not right. Um, so, but everybody believes that already. And I think the only way you could get around that is to appeal to their oh, wow. ra rational self interest by saying, if we charge for parking, you will get uh, free Wi-Fi. We gotta or... get off this analogy. <laughs> no, uh, no, we don't. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Every, more, everything they're, comes they're, at a, they're, with they're, a cost, right? They're I more. See I, every massage parlor they're, parking they're meant lot. To be more, but not not for a podcast. I think but, we uh, should. Uh, I think we should ceremoniously name very small massage parlor parking lots in in Mr. Shoop's honor and have you out for ribbon cuttings and no we, we, oh. we could have no we could have bigger massage parlors <laughs> wow so i'm going to transition i'm, just, I'm afraid may. chris i'm afraid that we've gone through all kinds of like ide moment opportunities and we've really so, missed it so okay, well, i i need okay. I, I i need to let you know that Every time I go to post one of our episodes on YouTube, it asks, does this have adult content? And I always <laughs> click no, right? Today I don't think today. we're there yet. Today is the oh, day. No, no, no we're all good. No, this is teenage co content. Right? <laughs> this is 13-year-old boy humor. <laughs> this is correct. So I got to ask you this question, Don. So last week, you know, just a week ago, we had Black Friday, right? And our friends at Strongtown, shout out to Chuck Marone and company and a whole bunch of others who went out and took images of the absurd, right? We know that so many of these, especially shopping centers, were built in uh, preparation for at least, you know, years ago, these big, you know, Black Friday sales. And we know that so much has changed with home delivery and Amazon and all that stuff. So I guess I'm curious, how how is that changing the parking discussion? Is it putting wind into the sales for Donald Shoup's arguments or is it taking it in a different direction? Uh, well, I think some cities are, are uh, trying these ideas out, and I, ha I haven't heard of any city that adopted a, a parking benefit district that, that ever abandoned it. Usually, if, if a uh, parking benefit starts in one part of town, or the first one was in, in Pasadena, California, and it turned a, what had been a commercial skid row into one of the most um, popular tourist destinations in Southern California. They had wonderful buildings in terrible condition in the 1970s and the, the, almost no parking because all the buildings were built um, so long ago and people thought it would never recover. Uh, but the city wanted to put in parking meters uh, because they had little off street parking and they just had a two hour time limit. And the merchant said, no way, that'll chase away all the few customers we have if you put in parking meters, when they knew that the, their employees or the owners would park on the street and move their car every two hours to get a free parking space and then complain their customers don't have parking. Yeah. So finally, <laughs> the city said, after they argued for two hours, the city said, well, if we put in the parking meters, uh, will spend all of the revenue to pay for added public services and public investment in your block. If you have meters on your block, you'll get this money. If you don't, if you're not part of the parking benefit district, you won't get anything. And the merchant said, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Let's <laughs> run the meters till midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. 
Uh, and the only thing that changed was the destination of the revenue. Uh, they could see these were a good idea. And pass it, the sales tax revenue tripled in the next five years. I bet it did. <laughs> uh, because because uh, certainly some people are not going to come and park at the curb if they have to pay, but they'll be replaced by somebody who is willing to pay. And who mm -hmm. do you think will spend more in a store? Somebody who will come only if they can park free after driving around for 20 minutes or somebody <laughs> who's willing to pay for parking if they can get out onto a clean sidewalk with healthy street trees hmm. and go into a store. So that's why the parking meter revenue was so uh, productive. And it, it generated, I think, about a little over a million dollars a year for the business improvement district. Uh, so I, that, and then once it starts in one part of town, other parts of town want the same thing. Even more prosperous parts of Pasadena said, we want one too. And now there are, I think I have maybe 16, count 16 cities that have park benefit district. Austin, Texas had some of the first, and now they have four more, and Houston has them. El Paso has them in a, their entertainment district, and they run the meters till three in the morning. I love it. <laughs> uh, because it's needed. They manage the curve. And I think that, uh, I hope that there are some planning commissioners who listen to your podcast, and I hope they feel ashamed of what planning has done. <laughs> so, Don, they, I just want to know, before we tell all those planning commissioners what to do, um, <laughs> I want to know if you could ask Americans to change a couple of their parking-related habits, what what would those things be? Well, I, I don't have any advice except for changing the, the incentives that these people uh, face. Say, I, I think people are just responding to the incentives that cities give them. If the curb parking is free, and you're in an older part of town with not a whole lot of off-street parking, won't you drive around hunting for a curb space rather than pay $5 an hour off street? It's very rational. We've all done it, cruising for parking. I mean, that's sort of a risque uh, <laughs> reference as well. But, but, uh, but, but you're cruising for parking. Everybody has done it. Uh, so I think that that's, that's the rational thing to do, unfortunately. So it's individually rational, <clears throat> but collectively insane. So I think if we charge the right <laughs> price for curb parking. So you sound everyone, like an economist. If we just uh, well, do the uh, right thing, people well, well, will do this. <laughs> we charge the right price, but it's so easy to do. I mean, it's so easy to explain. It's so easy to do. The technology of parking is now so much beyond the old fashioned parking meters, which were, were, were did change since the, I think the first one was, was, they were invented in 1935. The first parking meters were in Oklahoma City and everybody thought they were amazing. Uh, this magnificent technology and you put your money in and hope to get a back before your time ran out. And so people complained that uh, filed lawsuits went all the way to the Supreme Court, which did say that it's not illegal to charge for curb parking. Um, so I think that uh, then the parking meter industry stagnated for the, the, the rest of the 20th century. That, that you, just like in 1935, you put your money in and hope to come back before your, your time ran out. The, the, the critics called it an co infertile combination of, of an alarm clock and a slot machine. And how many other things did not change in the way you pay for it in the next 70 years? But fortunately, just when my book was published, there's been, since then, there's been this astonishing change in paying for parking. People do it with their cell phone. Uh, some newer cars have the uh, uh, parking app right in the dashboard. That's your, cool. your, your, phone, your car is just as connected to your phone is. So when you, uh, they can also guide you to the parking spot and give you turn-by-turn -turn directions. Uh, when you leave the parking spot, it, uh, it automatically stops paying for parking. You only pay for every minute that, where you park. Uh, 
So if you, if you want to stay longer, you can and pay more. Or if you get back early, you can, if you leave early, you save money. So I think the technology is so simple now for, for people to use um, that there's no reason not to charge market prices for curb parking. Awesome. Well, Don, we're going to transition a little bit into what we call the lightning round. Your writings are obviously prolific. We know you're part of the Parking Reform Network. We're going to make sure to, our audience knows how to get a hold of you or at least reach, reach out and see some of the things that you've read, if they haven't already, via your website and other things. We posted something just the other day. Again, it was a piece that you had written for Plan Edison, I think, a year ago. Um, <clears throat> and, and just incredible stuff. And we know that if you're a planner right now, you know that parking is having its day in the sense of it's being reformed. And we've had that discussion a bit on this podcast with other folks. And it's probably, I don't know if it's a hotter, it's one of the most hottest topics in the planning world. So um, we know that your efforts certainly have paved the way, no pun intended, um, for, for much of that to happen. So I want to make now sure we get to our lightning our round. codes to make it yeah, better. Yeah, so. Yes, for sure. So our little lightning round is just about you, the human being, a little get a, get a chance to know who you are, um, fun things that you know you like to do and that kind of stuff. So I'll throw you a couple softballs and then my colleagues will take their turn a little bit. I'm curious, where's the last place you went on a vacation? Uh, two harbors. Um, it's in Catalina, which is, I went wow. overseas. It, it, it's, uh, uh, that's if right. you know that's Catalina, right. that's funny. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Catalina is one of the places where they you can't import cars. Uh, people walk everywhere. And Two Harbors is a little village. It's not Avalon, which everybody, everybody goes to. Two Harbors is just a tiny place. And it looks like it was frozen in the 1950s, mm. <laughs> but it's uh, but the, you know I don't know how maybe a hundred people might live there. They have uh, tents, and they also have a wonderful old uh, a hotel. So that's the last place I've been. If I turned on the Donald Shoop stereo at home in your vehicle, if you have one, wherever it is, what is it probably going to be tuned in to hear? What's what music? Oh, ragtime, uh, uh, hmm. Scott Joplin. <laughs> Not Snoop? No Snoop? <laughs> well, I, I understand that Snoop is a very fine citizen. He, he, <laughs> he, he does a lot of good, but when you read the lyrics, <laughs> that no, I, I, I have a hard time hear, you know, decoding them in my ears. But no, <laughs> the, the, the lyrics are nothing that I would uh, recommend. Well, I want to know, uh, so pizza, pineapple or no pineapple? Ooh. Age old question. Well, if pizza were free, there'd never be enough. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Don, you always have a good question. Where are you at? <laughs> oh, mine, I was sorry. I was going to go back to a subject matter when you said it's been 50 years since your book. Have you ever seen or do you think there's a parking lot worthy of registry on the National Historic Register? Yeah. What's your favorite? Well, there's lot? certainly parking garages. Uh, <laughs> the older parking garages can't be very uh, handsome. They, they were in the 1920s um, and even 1930s. But now with with minimum parking requirements, they require so much parking and the, the, the parking uh, garages generate no revenue directly that they're built as cheaply as possible. You know, yeah. that they're often a blight on the landscape. And I think if, if getting back to planning commissioners, you could look at the design regulations for, for parking structures. Um, say San Diego uh, doesn't permit uh, well, you have to, the first floor of any garage has to be uh, commerce. It, can, yeah. it can't be devoted to parking. Say Beverly Hills, and Boulder, Colorado, they wrap the parking structures with housing or offices so that when you go alongside, walk along the sidewalk, you think you're in downtown, but really there's just a thin sliver of downtown and behind that is a parking structure. So <laughs> when, when you play Monopoly, do you skip the free parking space? Do you not <laughs> adhere to it? What what happens in that example? Well, if every if every one of the properties on the monopoly board had free parking, 
<laughs> and you had zoning limits on the number of houses you could have on it, the game would be no fun. <laughs> but you do. You can only have up to four, and then you go there. <laughs> but then you could have a hotel. That's yeah. true. That's and true. you get more hotel. That would never be allowed in most cities. Yeah, that's true. That's Gotta true. Watch out for that Atlantic Avenue. Um, oh, you made gosh. a reference earlier to Seinfeld. I think all of us are, are pretty big Seinfeld fans. I can't help but recall the episode that I got to ask a question based on. Are, parallel parking. Are you a front end? Or back in kind of a guy. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I I I'm a back in. How many parking tickets have you gotten in your lifetime? <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe two or three. Do you feel that those funds were valuable to the city? <laughs> oh, I'm sure they were, but they're hard to get. Uh, the, 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 the 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 enforcement uh, costs a lot. Uh, that they, they don't. What what you pay doesn't go to clean the sidewalks. Let me put it that way. Do you know? Um, do, this is my my best parking story. Is that in undergrad, I uh, didn't like to buy a parking pass for uh, my university because you yeah. had to park a long way away from the buildings and then take a bus in and all this stuff. And I didn't like buying that parking pass because I'd already paid tuition and I felt that I was being ripped off a little bit. And um, I wouldn't buy a parking pass and I would just park and get parking tickets. And I thought, what are they going to do to me? Well, my senior year, I didn't pay any of my parking tickets. And what they do to you <laughs> is they tow your car and then they keep your diploma. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, so wow. I reported my car stolen. <laughs> <laughs> ah, did you really? Well, and see, the campus the police found it at the impound lot. Oh. I was like. But that's a perfect example of parking. Nobody thinks that the parking violation is a criminal event or it's, 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 it's a victimless crime. But it is not, because if you take up a parking space, that's somebody that somebody else can't park there. And so I think that nobody, you already said there's too much parking. So I feel uh, like I was not doing at university, <laughs> but not at university. That's one of the few places where you expect to pay for parking, because, say, in California, it's state law saying that. Uh, the parking at university campus, UC, UC campuses, has to be self-supported. Oh, goodness. So the, the revenue that comes in has to pay for the parking garages. And our last parking garage at UCLA cost $84,000 per parking space. Oh, my God. So it's now people have, to pay, people, visitors have to pay $13 a day to park at UCLA. Why is it so expensive? It's because the driver has to pay for the parking. That's, well, that, it ended it, up being cheaper to do what I did than to uh, buy a parking pass. <laughs> well, <laughs> just, but, wrong. <laughs> but you're a perfect worse. example of the fact that you have to expect that people will cheat if they can, because yeah. uh, it doesn't seem like cheating. But if you're stealing it from the from the neighborhood where you're parking, it's the a university that I was paying my tuition to, you mean? <laughs> That's, but I think that. The, the, what, one reason, another reason that you can encourage uh, your citizens to, to charge for parking is that, say, like in a business district, like in old Pasadena, most of the people who park are not the, the property owners or the it's workers the there, it's the, the oh. visitors there. Mm. It's paid for by somebody else. It's not a tax. It's a user charge paid by somebody else. It's like Monty Python's idea for solving Britain's uh, financial problems is to charge tax foreigners living abroad. And I think that that's what it's like in a business district to, is to charge for curb parking is you, you're taxing foreigners living abroad. And you, you get healthy street trees, you get clean sidewalks, and you don't even know who pays for it, but you know it's not you. Perfect. Well... Donald Shoup, my temples are hurting. I've been laughing so hard. I think I need an aspirin. Um, but man, your time has been wonderful. We appreciate your insight. And as I mentioned, we'll be sure to post uh, the places people can reach out in and see some of your work again with the Parking Reform Network. And you continue to do great things at UCLA. Um, and man, your time here has been fantastic. And we certainly appreciate it. Well, thanks for inviting me. I've enjoyed it too. Good. <laughs> now we all I'll need never, to get a massage. Yeah, I think I'll so. never <laughs> see a massage parlor parking lot the same way. No doubt. Wait till the it, next so. one comes up on P and Z. <laughs> mm. 
Oh, I'll have to reference this episode. So, all right. Well, commissioners, thanks. With that, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. Thank you all for listening. We appreciate it. Uh, keep on tuning in. Check us out on YouTube. Check us out on all the places, Apple, Spotify, on and on and on and on. Uh, again, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. We'll keep on doing what we do. And thanks for tuning in. All right. Have a good day. Listener. Hey, listener. That's you. Would you like more content? Well, if you would, check out our YouTube page. Watch us there. Go to our Facebook page. Like us there. We do live episodes about every couple weeks, and all of our episodes are available on both of those platforms in addition to Apple, Spotify, and a whole bunch of other places where you get your podcasts. Tell us what you think. What about some guests or organizations that you think we should interview? We're game. Let us know. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. We'll try to keep up the good work. Now get back to your packet.